off top. In 1921, the Green Bay Packers were kicked out of professional football for playing a game with three Notre Dame players. A year later, Green Bay started a new NFL franchise named the Green Bay Blues. After one year, they changed their name back to the Packers. So the original Green Bay Packers are dead. They died in 1921. The Packers you may root for or against today are actually the Blues. Play the music. This is the Dominique Foxworth Show. What up, Charlie? How you like that Packer fact? <laughs> And in, in I, honor of Aaron Rodgers not making the playoffs. Yeah, I was about to say Aaron Rodgers is probably feeling pretty blue today. Oh my god, <laughs> I, I, I hate that so much. But I mean, it it had to be done, I guess. Yeah, Green Bay Packers history is kind of surprisingly, um, and I guess it's not surprisingly interesting. Like when you go to Green Bay, Wisconsin, you had you kind of end up thinking how why the hell is this here what the, and and it should you should expect a really interesting and sordid history which i've found and you can find later if you're interested but let's get ready for the playoffs what you got some questions for me yep i got a couple some burning questions for every single game of wild card weekend i initially laid this out we're going to do it in chronological order but then i was looking i was like oh the schedule make, makers gave us Worst to best in games over the weekend. So we're going to hop around. Uh, but before we get to the actual games, I want to ask you a question projecting forward from one of the games. That's ravens Bengals. On paper, a few months ago, we would have been like, that's a dream wild card weekend matchup. Not the case. The Bengals are one of the hottest teams in the NFL. The Ravens are sort of collapsing. I, yeah. I think it's a fair way to put it. And something interesting just happened. The Ravens signed Roquan Smith to a $100 million contract leaving their franchise tag open, which is conspicuous because Lamar Jackson is hunting for a new contract this offseason. I think it's pretty clear that team is in a weird spot. And the question I have is, do you see a world where Lamar Jackson is not the Ravens quarterback next season? It's a really hard world to imagine. I think it's very overwhelmingly likely that he will be the Ravens quarterback next year. But I do think there are a lot of things about this scenario or this situation that are incredibly interesting. When we talk about sports, we watch sports. And when you people like you and me talk about sports and even I guess fans, when they talk about sports with their friends, I think we subtract out a lot of the like emotional and interpersonal stuff. Right. And I find that incredibly interesting in this situation because what Lamar means to the city and what Lamar means to the team and what his like general attitude could be. And to be clear, I have no reason to believe that he's like submarining the team morale. I have like the opposite is what I've heard. But my point is if he's like upset at all and like justifiably upset because well, I mean, I, I feel like I don't have to justify why he deserves the, uh, a new contract. Anybody who's listened to this understands that. But it's a tough situation because I can understand both sides while I will always side on the player side because I'm hopelessly biased. I can understand being the general manager for the Ravens and thinking I'm not going to give you that Deshaun Watson deal because the Browns were dumb. Right. Like That doesn't mean I have to do something that's – a lot less dumb, honestly, but that also would like is inconsistent with the tradition of quarterback contracts. But anyway, from Lamar's side, I could imagine that there's a lot of dynamics that go into this that people may not be considering. So if you go back to when Lamar took over, they were on a losing streak. They were going to miss the playoffs. He joins, he takes over. They went six in a row. They get in the playoffs. John Harbaugh was being talked about as if his job was on the line, even though he had won a Super Bowl there. So he essentially saves John Harbaugh's job, or at least ends the discussions of John Harbaugh's um, position. The following year, he wins uh, the MVP. It's balling out. And he's like, and then the next year, he's good. He has a little bit of an injury concern, but he's still very good. Then this year, you can see the difference of the team with him on the field and without him on the field, but he's not as great as he's been. But... One of the key things I think about uh, Lamar Jackson's understanding how unique he is as a player and how unfairly he probably has been treated and how unfairly I'm sure he perceives he's been treated. I'm sure we all remember back when Bill Polian was saying he should be a receiver. And generally the criticism right. on Lamar Jackson is uh, 
a bit harsher and unfair in my view. And for Lamar, I imagine that he feels this, or I, I can't say for Lamar. If Ooh, I was in his one, position, one thing on that, just okay. as, as you go forward, is does it feel like Lamar Jackson has just been polarized? Like he just has the biggest fans and the biggest critics? Because I, when you say unfairly treated, I'm like not sure I totally agree yeah. with the media just because I think that like the media also has people – even at our company, who who carry water for him to sort of balance the scales of him being unfairly treated. Yes. Like I think he's maybe covered so, in, improperly, but I don't know yeah. if it's unfair. Maybe I should. Um, so I would say that it, it is probably um, unfair or at least forget fair, unfair, inconsistent with the way that other people yeah. covered. And maybe you could justify that by saying he's a different player than any of the other players. That's fine. That's not a debate that I was willing to have that I was interested in mm -hmm. having. I appreciate you stopping me because it allows me to clarify because I imagine other people misunderstood what I was trying to say is not even about how he's being covered or how he's being talked about, but just coming into the league, there was a lot around him that other players yeah. don't have around him. So I'm not even talking about the media as much as I'm talking about, there were some teams who didn't even have them on a draft board. Cause they're like, we don't even consider him a quarterback. So I guess my point is it probably to him, or if it were me in his situation, it would feel like the world is against me. However, Baltimore loves me. This place yes. loves me. They drafted me. And at every turn, they defend me. And I know that this is my place until this offseason. <laughs> and then yeah. this regular season. And now this time right now. And I think that's uh, while I do understand the Ravens position, like I don't think what the Ravens are doing is like dumb, but I think it's risky. Like I, yeah. I wouldn't have the 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 guts to do this myself. I would have paid him, and if it had to be fully guaranteed, I would have done that also because I recognize that his he's he is on that level. He's on Patrick Mahomes' level. Like what Patrick Mahomes mm. means to the to the Chiefs, and like I'm not arguing that he's as good a quarterback as right. Patrick Mahomes because that would be absurd. But what Patrick Mahomes means to the Chiefs. Lamar Jackson means to the Ravens. So uh, it's a real challenging spot to be in, in an organization that's pretty well thought of by players to be positioning yourself and your team and your star player in a way that feels uncomfortable. And uh, I think that conversation about him having an agent is like, I honestly, I see the argument for wanting him to have an agent, but I fall on the other side. Uh, where it's like you can deal with, I think one of the pushbacks is then you have to hear people talk bad about you that you work for. Okay. That could be hard. Um, he could potentially deal with that. But I think in Lamar's case, I think it comes down to trust. And we always assume that the agent works for you because you're paying him. But if you really think about it, and I think I, we've talked about this before, because I remember my agent called me and wanted to check in, make sure I wasn't mad at him because I said this, but it's how I genuinely feel, is that agents have a uh, an incentive to have a good, a better relationship with the teams than they are incentivized to have a good relationship with one player. Right. Because they're going to be dealing with them year in, year out, time and time again. So now if the conversation and just pulling numbers out of the air, if Lamar is looking at a hundred guaranteed, but he wants 200 guaranteed mm -hmm. that the agent could be incentivized to not be a hard ass. Whereas Lamar is like, no, I, I him and whoever else is working to advise him is like, no, I have potentially one bite of this apple and this is my position. And I don't care if you hate me afterwards. I don't care if you're willing to work with me again. I'm going to take everything that I can right now because I, I have to. So I don't know. I, I don't know if any of that is useful or I know none of it's relevant to this weekend, unless you think, which a lot of people do think that Lamar Jackson is very reasonably being extra cautious right now because, no his, because yeah, his money's so not guaranteed. Say. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. impossible to say, but it's something that's out there. And I guess I'll be clear that I'm not insinuating or speculating, but again, if I'm in his shoes, uh, I know how important uh, these games are because we all have recency bias. I know right. that the, the leverage that you have in negotiation is going to be more impacted by what happens at the end of this season than anything else. 
If he's playing MVP level ball, then he has a lot of leverage. If he's not playing at all and their offense is terrible, he has a little less leverage, but he has leverage. If he goes out there and plays and looks bad, he's really undercutting his leverage, even if you can point to injury, because then they'll be like, well, I don't know, we see what you are when you're injured. Well, let's actually, that's a point. I want to follow up on that, on that exact point. So early this season on a lot of shows, the prevailing thought was the price is going up for Lamar Jackson because the first four weeks of the year, he was playing really good football close to 2019, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then he started playing worse football, yeah. but his value to the team was also demonstrated by the fact that when they don't have him on the field, they are an atrocity on offense, a true atrocity. So does he have more leverage or less leverage than he did when he went out? Because I genuinely don't know, because he is also playing the worst football he's played since he was a rookie. Yeah. Um, I think he has more leverage. I, I, I always tend to lean in the leverage is in the franchise quarterback's favor. If you solidify mm-hmm. yourself as a franchise quarterback, the leverage is in your favor because um, what's your alternative? And I know this firsthand from – uh, CBA negotiations is that was and and honestly like business school that was something that we talked about a lot in the negotiation class is like um, the your best alternative is like really what your leverage is your best alternative and when we're in negotiations like all right if there's a work stoppage our best alternative as players is to dip into our savings and hold tight yeah the owner's best alternative is their fucking billionaires and so that dynamic is a little bit flipped when you had when you're a franchise quarterback, because what's their best alternative to go back to the quarterback wasteland that they existed in for every single season, other than the couple of months when Joe Flacco blacked out, or have a franchise quarterback? Well, that's an interesting question because how many teams regret signing? their franchise quarterback to a deal that then becomes the standard bearer for all of the quarterbacks, because I would think more than you think, I think outside yeah, I, of those I think top, we, top guys, people probably yeah. regret it. I, I don't know. I think we might have a real disagreement right here, but I guess maybe we don't have the time to stop and do the research, but I think that we've already bought up recency bias. I think you might just be having a little Deshaun Watson, Russell Wilson, um, recency bias. It's, right. It, uh, I think, you have a chance, even the Vikings through the whole, and I don't mean any disrespect to Kirk <laughs> cousins, but through the whole Kirk cousins tenure, the Vikings have felt like they had a chance and frankly have had chances. They've been competitive and like they, they haven't been an afterthought. They had the misfortune of being in the same division as Aaron Rodgers. but I don't know. I guess the question is, would you rather be the Vikings over this stretch or would you rather be like, uh, the Jags, you know, like over a stretch of just quarterbacklessness. But I guess your argument would be eventually you land uh, yeah. Trevor well, Lawrence. Well, but also, you, you look at the Vikings in particular. It's like they're the closest they came to a Super Bowl. Case Keenum right. was their quarterback. That was my point. That's why I picked this team because like, I was trying to think of the worst example where someone okay. paid and continuously and over and over again paid a guy. And I don't think the Vikings would regret it. That's yeah. that's my view, but I guess it's also they this, they continuously tr- uh, drafted incredible wide receivers. Let's put you let's know. let's let's earmark this because this is a good off season episode. Let's okay. we're gonna do a we're gonna do like a statistical study and look through all the people that people call franchise quarterbacks and figure out how many are regrettable. I like it. All right, yeah, that was a real sidetrack from your questions. We might have to speed through the rest of them. All right, so next I'm gonna go to the best game for the weekend: Cowboys and Bucks. Um, I thought about going football nerd here and asking you, you know, can the Bucks offensive line hold up? But let's not bore the audience. What I really need to know is whose future is in more peril if they lose to the Bucks, Dak or Mike McCarthy? Ah, I, Mike McCarthy. Uh, not to piggyback on that same conversation we just had, but Dak will be harder to replace than Mike McCarthy. The replacement for Mike McCarthy might already be on his staff. It might be Dan Quinn that they bump up. They could upgrade um, to Sean Payton. Uh, I don't think that either of them future is really um, in question, but uh, moving on from Dak seems incredibly unlikely because of all the things that we just named, because what are they going to do? Trade for Aaron Rodgers? In there? Okay. Yeah, we have to, again, we have to look and see if that's even uh, 
possible or feasible for the cap. From what I understand, the cap hit would be entirely too heavy for Green Bay to uh, trade Aaron Rodgers and also not have or well, not have him on the team and still have the huge hole in their cap, but maybe they'd be tanking or something. I don't know. Seems like a, a unlikely plan. So you don't and think Aaron there's Rodgers any was, anything was to... not good this year. Do you don't think also. there's anything to worry about with Dak who has played a stretch of football that's been incredibly turnover prone and this team is ready to win right now? No. I mean, I, I think you should be worried about him turning the ball over, but not a long time worried about him as a player. I, I got to be honest is I think that they've, they overachieved at certain points in the season. Hmm. And I think it got our expectations up pretty high. They're stretched with a, winning with a backup quarterback. Their defense was uncommonly dominant. And they have not been that since. Yeah, they have not been that since. And we keep expecting them to be that. And I don't think that's who they are. I think they had a good stretch. And I think they're actually more closer to mediocre defense. And the expectations have been raised on this team. One, because they're Cowboys. And two, because they have some uh, pretty impressive runs. But yeah, Dak's not in trouble. Okay. Next next game. We'll rush. We'll go to this one because it's we touched on this team a little bit with the Vikings. And I don't want to, I have two questions here because I don't want to just do just hammer the quarterbacks, right. but last time they played, it was a close game and Wink Martindale went full Wink Martindale and he just blitzed the living out of Kirk cousins, but it didn't work. He just, he yeah. just got the ball to Justin Jefferson. Yeah. Is he going to be able to restrain himself and not go full Mart Wink Martindale in this game? I mean, he has restrained himself a lot more this season than I thought. I think his, I think a lot of the um, the blitz measures don't account for how many people are blitzing or how many people are rushing. They just like if a secondary player or a second level player rushes, they consider a blitz. But I noticed that Wink is doing a lot of like overload stuff where linebackers and nickels and safeties come. But only 2D linemen come and then they drop into the coverage. So it's still just a four man rush. And so they try to create the, create the illusion and create an overload or create a, a hole in the protection without actually compromising uh, their coverage. So I suspect that they're going to do attempt to do a lot of that. But I don't know what the answer is because game planning for the Vikings is essentially game planning for Justin Jefferson. Right. Um, double teaming Justin Jefferson. It gives you a, a chance to stop him. But in that particular game, in several games, Kurt throws it anyway, and Justin gets open and makes plays. So I don't necessarily think that blitzing is dumb. I think go back to the beginning of the season, one of the reasons why I thought they should blitz a lot um, is because of the high variance. So I guess it feels like if you're comfortable blitzing, you should blitz. It'll put um, more pressure on Kurt Cousins. If you lose that way, so be it. Because playing soft and giving Kirk Cousins time, you could still lose. I mean, it really comes down to if you can get pressure with four, that makes everything a lot better. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure what – I know Derek Shaw's been playing again, but uh, that could change at any moment. So, And this is the first time over the last couple of weeks the Giants' defense has been healthy, like all year. And Kayvon Thibodeau has become a completely different player off the edge. That's that's the big one. Um, yeah, the, the Thibodeau pass rush – if he can take over that game and rush opposite Derrishaw, uh, that changes a lot of things. And and Wink uh, won't have to blitz as much. And they could roll coverage to uh, to Justin Jefferson. Hmm. Um, just a quick follow-up on this game. Which quarterback would you rather have, Kirk Cousins or Daniel Jones? I, I know where I would go with it. but um, I'll take Daniel Jones. Same. Yeah. In a heartbeat. I mean, Daniel Jones' running ability, and he also has this, like, it's kind of like um, Purdy and that we don't know what Daniel Jones would look like with some help. Yeah. You know, like, Purdy, we don't know. It's it's a little different in that. When I talk about Purdy, he has plenty of help, but we don't know what he will look like in certain situations because we haven't seen much of him. It's actually a pretty bad analogy. But anyway, the point is, Daniel Jones, there is a lot, even though he's been around for a while, there feels like there's some uncertainty around him and there's some hope 
that like with good coaching and good players, given what he showed this year, that there's something to build on. Kirk Cousins, we know what he is, which is uh, like the Mendoza quarterback, right? He's like that yeah. line. He's probably yeah. higher than than the line, but he's he's the guy who you compare everybody against. If you're significantly worse than him, then we don't want you. Yeah, I mean, he's very lucky this game is not at prime time. Um, <sighs> let's go to the Seahawks 49ers. Um, nothing to talk about here. Nothing. <laughs> I don't know. No, ask your question. What's your question? Okay. Okay. Well, I got two questions. Uh, which 49ers uh-huh. more important to you, Brock Purdy or Christian McCaffrey? This li- this goes into the running backs don't matter, mattered a bit. The, the background being obviously their offense has been pretty electric since Purdy's been in, but also they went from the 28th rushing attack by DVOA to second since they traded for McCaffrey. Yeah, I'd say Nick Bosa, Fred Warner, those guys, Travis Ward. <laughs> I think the 49ers defense is the most important thing in this game. Uh, if they play as well as we expect them to play, then Purdy and McCaffrey not going to have to do much. Um, if you're asking me, uh, if you're forcing me to answer the question you ask, I lean Purdy. I mean, it's hard to get me off of quarterback if you're asking me an offensive player who's more important. I get the argument in that um, McCaffrey's versatility and his ability to take short passes and all right. that stuff and create matchup issues. Uh, I think that really takes a lot of pressure off of Brock Purdy. However, Brock Purdy's going to have to make some plays. And I guess maybe this is a a broader conversation about the playoffs as a whole. And he's shown the ability to, like, make plays that aren't just, like, screen passes and checkdowns. Like, he's been better in this stretch than uh, Jimmy Garoppolo in many of his stretches. So I am not coming down on Purdy. I do think that he's still really young and still really inexperienced. And I think his play the the um delta in his best play and what potentially his worst play could be is much bigger than McCaffrey. And mm-hmm. so I think he's more important and it makes me more concerned about him, even though he's shown us that he can do it. And to, to your point, like the 49ers could win and McCaffrey could have 50 yards because yeah. Debo or Kittle had explosive plays and yeah. the defense was dominant. Um, I do have one tiny follow-up on this. We have given Kyle Shanahan all of the credit for this offense are we kind of underappreciating what purdy's doing he's like seventh yeah. round pick he's played unbelievably the i'm not kidding the only comp for how he's played to start his career is tom brady i know uh, he's not tom brady i thought you were gonna say patrick mahomes i thought you were gonna go even crazier tom brady yeah. wasn't all that good early in his career i just mean like get, you know yeah like this type pick. of success so yeah. um <sighs> yes i think you're right but i think we should because it's zero sum we can't we don't have the ability to give credit to equally to both of them someone has to get it and the man who's done it at a bunch of different locations with a bunch of different quarterbacks and 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 unique styles particularly when you include rg3 yeah i'm I'm gonna go ahead and give him the credit uh before I start talking about Mr. Irrelevant, like like we got it all wrong. Well, I guess we did get it all wrong. He's proven that we've gotten it all wrong. But if I have to pick one of those two guys to give the credit to, I think we, as a general media complex, are on the right one. It's Kyle. Yeah. Okay, so pivoting from Shanahan to the Shanahan coaching tree, because we thought that Mike McDaniel's offense was going to be a, a shanahan light type of situation yeah. where – you know, you get the ball out quickly to fast guys and they make plays and the running game works. Why can't the Dolphins offense function at all with Teddy Bridgewater or Skylar Thompson? I have no idea. Like, I wish I knew. I mean, I think that we have to... No, not I wish I knew. You got to give credit to uh, to Tua. And I think that part of it is... And to give credit to McDaniel, or McDaniel's... Yeah, this one is McDaniel. Yeah, the other one is McDaniel's. To give credit to McDaniel, uh, in similar ways to the Ravens building an offense around Lamar's skill set, he built an offense around what uh, Tua does well. His um, RPOs, his quick, accurate 
passes, not relying on arm strength, like quick decision making, that sort of stuff is what this offense is designed to do. That'd be my best argument for why it's not working with anybody else. It's because it's not, it, it is specially designed for him and to do the things that he does well. Hmm. That makes sense. Um, last one. This is sort of a not that fun of a game. We got Chargers Jaguars. Could you see Brandon J- Brandon Staley losing his job if they lose to the Jaguars with how week 18 <sighs> went? Yeah, I doubt it. I mean, I think the week 18 was ridiculous and playing his players and getting them nicked up in a completely meaningless game and then leaving uh, the rest of them in the game for much longer after that. It's just none of it made sense. Uh, they've gotten better, uh, and they got hit with the injury bug, which they kind of do every year. feels like this is one of those teams that's just perpetually snake bitten. Obviously they are the chargers, but I guess it also depends on for who, like the Sean Payton thing is hanging over everything. I'm not sure Mm -hmm. what they would do if Sean Payton was interested, if they're just going to fire him. I don't think they're going to fire him without a plan in place. Uh, so yeah, I think it's unlikely that he gets fired. I actually think if you're picking a team that could like do a Bengals run like last year, I think the Chargers mm. are that team. It's because like they have they are so talented, yeah, and they have a quarterback that has the ability to completely go off like Joe Burrow did for stretches last year and 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 carry this offense. And they've been competitive with the chiefs, even though they haven't beaten them, they've been close with the chiefs. Uh, so that would be their next game. If they won this. And I, I mean, they could potentially beat the chiefs. Then they're in a the championship game. And you just need uh, Herbert to, to just black out and boast it against some sacks. If he's healthy and Staley had him out there playing in a meaningless game. So yeah, I, I think they're, they could also just lose to the Jags. So <laughs> they aren't that good, but they could get hot. It's such Which is true of the Bengals because the yeah. Bengals, the Bengals should have lost to the Titans last year when they gave up nine sex. But yeah, this I'm, is a stay away. That game was so bizarre. I never forget the Ryan Tannehill threw like 700 interceptions in that game. Yes, they were bad. He started the first play of the game was a pick, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And he threw the clincher. Um, terrible. Should we move on to some bets? Yeah, let's bet them up. All right. So we're 28 and 26 on the year. We've been hot. We, uh, I, I believe we are 10 and five in our last 15 picks. Um, 10 and five. Nice. Four and one so, last week. So I got some picks here for you. Let me know if you like them. If you don't, if I get consternation, unsure, we're going to toss them out. First right. one, two team teaser. We're teasing the Bengals down to minus two and the 49ers down to minus three and a half. We get six points on both those games. And the line is minus 120 for it. Yeah, that's easy. Uh, I like that. Those are, yeah, two heavy favorites. Good call. I don't see either of them getting upset in this game. Okay. Next one. This is a big spread, but I'm assuming Skylar Thompson's playing because of it. The, what do you think about the Bills minus 13? The Dolphins in Buffalo. Huh. Yeah, The this, again, I feel like the this is 13 such a big number. Skylar Thompson is not a starter in this league. And the Bills are not as good as they once were, but winning by two touchdowns is a lot. Like, I could see a scenario where they give up a late touchdown. I like it. Stick with it. Let's go. There's there's some pushback, so I'll put that as a maybe. We'll circle back to it. Um, 13 points is a lot of points. Well, here's the – we have another Bills one, too. Okay. Josh Allen's over one and a half passing touchdowns. Yeah. I like that. Lock it in. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm good with that one. Um, next one, Daniel Jones over six and a half rushing attempts. Oh, yeah, lock it in. He's been over in three of his last five games. Yeah, and we, I mean, that's that includes scrambles. Like, it's not just yeah. they're going to they're gonna design four of them for him at least. Scramble twice, we're good to go. Yeah. Oh, well, then we need scramble three times, six yeah. and a half. That's a lot. That's a lot, but I like it. Keep it. Okay, and then here's one. Tom Brady over 0.5 rushing yards. This is plus 280 <laughs> odds. This is this is just a quarterback sneak bet. This That's is it. if he's going to quarterback sneak. Yeah. That's a fun one. Let's go with it. Let's go All with right. it. He's going to get a one-yard QB sneak touchdown. I say we toss the bills and we go with those four. All right. 
I trust you. I, I don't I, know if I feel more confident about the sneak or the bills, but we'll. Or we could leave. We could leave them all five. We could leave all five in. Let's go all five. Let's go hard. Right. It's, it's super wild card weekend. Bet them all. All right. Locking them in. All right. Appreciate you, Charlie. Looking forward to the games. I'm pumped. I love wild card weekend. Who's going to have the best weekend? Oh, Single Burrow. player. Burrow. He's going to light it up, and we're going to all talk about him in the same breath as Mahomes and Allen. I love it. All right. Well, thanks, Charlie. Appreciate you, Christina Buswell, Sarah Abbott, Adi Khan. Everybody enjoyed it. We can do nobody, none of the producers have a team in the playoffs, do we? Like, yeah. Yeah, loser podcast around here. Oh well. I guess we can root for the Ravens because I played for them. Yeah. It's your team. They're gonna lose. All right. Bye. This is the Dominique Foxworth Show.